one typical British town. Its high street was once its heart and soul. Not anymore. But what if we could turn back time? To the days of the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. A group of shopkeepers and their families have left the 21st century behind. You are going to discover what the high street was really like. Your aim is to make this town fall in love with its high street again. Today's mantra is sell, sell, sell. Each week, they're living and trading through a different era. Can I get any more left? From Victorian to Edwardian. Rabbits, pheasants. Through peacetime <laughs> and wartime. The swinging 60s to the shocking 70s. <laughs> 100 years of high street history. It's absolutely magical. Can they sell the products of the past to 21st century customers? Oh, the poor creatures. I'd be frightened to give this to the birds. <laughs> pin, pin. And can they make a profit while they're at it? This is unbelievably hard. I don't know how these poor buggers did this in the old days. If I'm really being honest, I hate it. This time, the shops move into the 1930s. Happy days. For some, times remain tough. The children are actually working harder now than they've ever done. But for others, life is sweet. That's £1.25, please. It's money we've made all day. And competition... That's interesting. ..takes hold on the high street. <laughs> the grocer's strike again. <laughs> but can the shopkeepers win over a whole new set of customers? I wish I could be in olden days. First century traders have been kitted out for the 1930s. I've got no idea what's going to happen. I've got no knowledge of the 30s at all. Apart from Jeeves and Wooster, that's about all I know. <laughs> for some, it was the golden age of shopkeeping. The 1930s High Street was filled with mass produced brands and cheap imports from the British Empire. As the demand for handcrafted goods disappeared, life for shopkeepers got a little easier. But will that be true for the families of our shopkeepers? They're all heading to the historic heart of Shepton Mallet in Somerset, where their 1930s shops await them. Making sure they stick to the rules of the era will be their very own Chamber of Commerce. Social historian Juliet Gardner, Tom Herbert, a fifth-generation baker, and Greg Wallace, a successful greengrocer. Welcome back to the 1930s High Street. Now, we're out of the shadow of the First World War, and the worst of the Great Depression. And although it's still pretty tough for a lot of people, the country is beginning to get itself back on its feet again. So those that are fortunate enough have found that life's little luxuries are becoming affordable again. Now, you've actually come together as a strong community of shopkeepers, but this week we want to see a real lift in your takings, a real rise. And you are going to have to cater for a whole new breed of customer, children. This is an era of fun for children, all right? Go to your shops, have fun with this, put your all into it, good luck. Off you go. The biggest change to the grocery store awaits the Surgisson family in their stockroom. It's stacked floor to ceiling with boxes of well-known brands. Oh, we got Maltesers! Oh my god! And Capri's roses! And licorice all sorts! <laughs> oh, wow. The 1930s saw a boom in confectionery thanks to a glut of cheap sugar arriving from Britain's colonies. Oh my god! Quality streets! Do you know what? I'm so glad I'm not wearing a corset, otherwise I won't be able to eat anything. Most of the chocolate bars sold today were invented between the wars. Among them, Aero, Crunchy and Smarties. Now, of course, they're going to have so many packaged goods and also their packages, their brand names that people recognise, aren't they? Oh, my God, we've got HP! I could pee my pants, That's I'm so it, excited. Oh, I could, I'm so excited. 
They're really proud of themselves, their sales so far. Yeah, yeah. I think they could really now come into their own. They could yeah. rock it. And now, of course, they're going to have so many packaged goods, they're going to have to be doing far less sort of bagging up of sugar and biscuits and all that sort of stuff. The Devlin family are hoping for an easier time too. In the Edwardian era, they struggled to combine baking bread with running a formal tea room. Caroline, a gourmet bread maker in the 21st century, had to bake a product she knows little about. Please, no more cakes. <laughs> oh, no! That's not bad. Oh, God. <laughs> why didn't the Chamber of Commerce Come tell on. us? You know why, don't you? Because they thought I'd go running from the square. <laughs> <laughs> In the 30s, people in work did have more disposable income, and so they were prepared not just to spend on the necessities, but a few luxuries. And, of course, what's a finer luxury than cake? We've expected great things from them, and I'm not sure they have quite no. delivered yet. They've always found it tough. Now, they think it's a question of technology. In the 30s, they've got a better mixer, electric oven and a bread slicer. I don't believe it, boys! What? Oh, wow, look at that. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, Chuck, I just feel so much better. It's We've electric. Got electricity. Oh my gosh. We can produce anything now. Yeah. Oh god. Okay. <laughs> all of a sudden, all of my concerns are lifted. The butchers too are about to benefit from the way technology was transforming the high street. One of their problems before was keeping the meat fresh. Uh, now at least they've got refrigeration, but most people didn't have refrigeration in their homes in the 30s, but it was coming into commercial premises. Andrew Sharp, a butcher by trade for 30 years, quickly feels at home in his new shop. We know what we're doing, don't we, lad? The challenge this year is actually specifically about making money, whereas the others, it was kind of a byproduct. Yeah. This one is solely about making money. During the Edwardian era, 14-year-old Michael was left in charge of his father's shop and discovered a passion for making a profit. In one day, I took more money than we took all week. And it looks like Michael's luck is in. In the 1930s, frozen imports meant meat with every meal was more affordable for all, especially a modern-day favourite, beef. When they've got an item that everybody knows and loves, a beef, they should clean up. If they can't make money in the 30s, let's face it, they never can. Simon Grant Jones doesn't yet know what kind of shop he'll be running. In the Victorian era, he ran an ironmonger's and made stock for it himself. A blacksmith in the 21st century, he proved his skills once had a place right in the heart of the high street. But by the early 20th century, there was already less call for his craft. His business was basically an Edwardian pound shop. But now, it's something for the kids. This is a bit more like it, isn't it? Fantastic, yeah. This is a proper toy shop. By the 1930s, concerns about child welfare and declining birth rates meant that the government and parents were giving children more attention than ever before. It was good news for the British toy industry. But according to the manual of rules which each shopkeeper has to trade by, it won't all be fun and games for Simon. I've got to be in the shop from nine to five. Mm. <laughs> I don't like being closed in for a start. I prefer to work outside. Um, so it will be a bit of a hardship. Simon, as a blacksmith, is not used to interaction with customers. He makes things, that's what he loves to do. But he's got to learn yeah. the art of the shopkeeper. I've got to make a profit. I can't give the stuff away as much as I'd like to. I'd like to give all this away to kids. Dressmaker Jill is also facing change in her rooms above the toy shop. Wow. The fashions are a lot freer than any of her Edwardian outfits. This is all really nice and all really wearable. The Edwardian stuff was great for dressing up in, but this, this stuff people can wear today. I can sell this to real modern women. Not only are the fashions more accessible, but Jill won't have to hand make everything as she did in the Edwardian era. By the 30s, the typical high street was selling cheaper, mass produced clothing. Having off the peg stuff to sell for me is going to be novel. I mean, I'm not really a salesperson 
who's just about selling for the money. Um, I'd only want to sell something that I was completely confident was right for that person. She's got products up there that are off the peg, and that is what's going to drive her business. That's where the bulk of her income's going to come from. But for Jill, who's a dressmaker at heart, there's a welcome bit of kit. Oh, there's a sewing machine. Excellent. Oh, what a relief. Oh, fantastic. Now I've got an electric machine. I can, I can make proper dresses. The shopkeepers have a lot to do before the shops open. They've started to tempt people back to this unloved high street. But can they now make their shops even more profitable by upping sales? I don't like the Maltesers there. I think the milk tray look better there. They've got to work hard this week, for sure, but there has never been a better opportunity to bring this high street back to life. The emphasis on good service is still important. That didn't Ooh, sound very good. that didn't sound very good. That sounded like something blowing. Something's gone. Three ovens blown. In fact, one half of the oven is now kaput. So we're cooking one half? <laughs> yeah, we can't even do that. No. It won't reach the temperature. Oh, great start. Fantastic start. I feel another <laughs> late night coming on. 1930s technology has let them down. There is no guarantee, um, given the situation we find ourselves in, that we're going to have any products to sell for 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Yet again, we're on the back foot. Unlike the Devlins, the other traders can relax, knowing they've got ready-to-sell stock in their shops. We'll do exceptionally well on the, you know, with what we've got to sell. The customer experience is going to be a lot better because we've really got things they're going to want. When I first uh, walked in, as soon as we started to see the sweets and chocolate, I fell in love. <laughs> that was really good. I really, I just love everything about 30 so far. Everyone's up early to get ready for their first day of trading as 1930s shopkeepers. At the butchers, they've got to turn a dead cow into saleable cuts. Andrew is keen to give customers an authentic taste of the 30s. We are going to cut it up in a manner that would be more accustomed to those days which will make it harder to sell, but more realistic. No, just... Michael. Cut it how we, you normally would, because then we can sell more. No, seeing we can... As, but since all the challenge is to make money, it seems stupid no. to do that. No, we're going to... It'll be easy. You just said it won't. It'll be easy. In contrast to the pre-packaged steaks most of us buy today, 30s customers would ask for cuts like flank, blade and point-end brisket. Bollocks. <laughs> I've cut it. What you done wrong? I've took that bone out. I didn't mean to do it that way. It's because I haven't done this for 20 years. Cutting up meat the traditional way might be tricky, but it's drawing in shoppers. That's not a bad bit there. Morning. The first customers have been regulars since the Victorian era, a group of locals who have promised to shop only on the historic high street. Thank you very much. It's such a treat to see meat that looks like me. It's rather good to be able to see it before, before you... Yes. Yeah. And it said it's already cut up. Andrew's relishing the chance to show off his old-fashioned expertise. What we're going to do is to cut this into flat bits like that. Okay which is a round of beef, which is what that is. It was very nice to go into a, an independent butcher again um, and actually see what it is you're buying. The colour, it's the texture, the quality of it, and also some cuts that you don't normally see. Unlike his dad, Michael wants to take a more modern retail approach. And he's making use of a 1930s technological breakthrough. Cellophane. I can sell everything and anything 
out of a packet. You know, so if um, in the morning we get everything prepped, wrapped up, if somebody comes in, I want a steak. Thank you very much. Ready packaged for you. It's the easiest way of making money. It's the start of the end. <laughs> well, it is. It's the it's the commencement of, of you know, the, the 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 shop not being a butcher's anymore and being a, um, an addendum to the grocer. Righty ho. Let me see what you've got for us that you recommend them. Could I interest you in Aberdeen Angus steak? Is it going to be like packaged like that? Or is it, it is. Just going to be. Packaged like that. More like modern times. Proper wrapping. No, no, thank you. What is that? But not everyone's ready for modernity. I really didn't like that. I prefer to have my meat in brown paper, to be honest with you. I don't need the packaging. I don't want it. At the grocers, the Surgesons are preparing to target the younger consumer. Today's mantra is sell, sell, sell. <laughs> Especially to the little ones. <laughs> Now, be careful, because it's suddenly loose and goes bloody everywhere without it. Wake up every morning and have a cup of tea. Like so much else that was once made in-store or locally, by the 30s, even unbranded confectionery was mostly factory-made. The new sweets could be a huge money spinner, even though Saffron's already eating into the profits. It's just really cool because I can just eat all I want. <laughs> There'll still be loads for the customers. Half past nine is quite the time. Coffee and a bun. And Carl wastes no time targeting his junior customers. Chaps. Would you like a little sweetie? Yeah. What did you say? Yes. Just one each, though. I think behind the counter would be a far better place for the sweets. I think that in the 30s they've already learnt about impulse buying for parents. Very similar to nowadays when you get to the checkout and then bang, they shove sweets in your face. Time to stop and enjoy a little treat. For the first time, the grocers can tap the lucrative pocket money market. Oh, feed me, feed me, feed me till I. Kids. Absolutely hate kids. But if I'm making money and I'm sending stuff to kids, then I'll be the nicest chap on the planet. <laughs> Every kind of sweet you can think of. Yeah. But I can't wait to get them out of my face. What would you like? Blue sherbet. Blue sherbet. Lovely stuff. What's your fizzy thing? That's one pound twenty-five, please. Thank you. <laughs> I've got red hand. And I've got a lovely finger. <laughs> sherbet peps are the best. It's okay. the best shot we've had in Shepton. I'd rather have this shot than any other shot, it's got everything. Sure, yeah, that's it. Carl that's it. may not like children, but today he's brought them joy. I can't stand them, but I'm taking money off them, I'll smile all day long. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is good now I want to see all the school kids going by. Best prime cuts of beef off the butcher. <laughs> <laughs> right, so do you all, uh, you all eat meat at home, yeah? What's your favourite meat to eat? McDonald's. Right. The butchers may not be a hit, but there is one other store which should be an obvious magnet for children. <laughs> yes, great. I love them. But it remains to be seen whether, in the age of computers, there are any customers for traditional toys. What if I said to you, give up all your modern day toys for a week and play with these? happy for like like try something new out how would you think mum that they'd get on without their modern day <laughs> toys um, i think it's going to be a struggle to keep them entertained and i'm not sure comey's gonna react very well either because um he's <laughs> i think physically attached to his ds at the moment and simon isn't exactly giving his stock the hard sell i love this i could stay here all day Oh, I love those. They're brilliant. They're one of my favourite toys, they are. Oh! Even when the after-school crowd arrives, Simon seems more interested in being one of the kids than he is in making money from them. That's really pretty. Whoa. Simple, isn't it? I sometimes feel as if I ought to give the kids the toys because I really want them to have them. And when they haven't quite got enough money to buy the toys, it's, I, it's quite upsetting for me, actually, because I really want them to have it. Definitely oh, better than today's toy shops. Yeah. You, people tell you about these things, but you've never actually seen them, so you don't know what they're like yet. I like the fact that he just flips over so easily. I wish I could be in olden days. But customers are less impressed with the bakers. Do you have actually bread? We don't have any bread. 
Have you any bread? We don't have bread, no, not at the moment. It's a bit nuisance I've got to come back tomorrow for the bread. You know, I've got to go to work. I suppose people didn't have to, did they? Their oven is still not working. And there's another obstacle they have to overcome. Their big money spinner should be cakes, but Caroline loathes making them. I came in here actually hating cake making. I mean, with a vengeance. You know, if you, if you said that was the only thing I could do other than, I don't know, kind of, oh, I don't know, fight crocodiles or something. I'd probably have more of a go about fighting crocodiles than making cakes. So the Chamber of Commerce have sent her to learn the art of 1930s cake making at a country house hotel. Her teacher will be pastry chef Jason Hornbuckle. Hello there, nice Hi. to meet you. And to you. You all right? Welcome. Thank you. OK, so we're going to make some cakes today. Excited? Very. Good. I feel so nervous that actually my stomach is kind of up here at the minute. Um, it's okay. about lack of confidence that I don't That's like it. making cakes. It's because it's out of my comfort zone. I just wanted to make sure that I don't cook this up. You're so not. That's any lovely. kind of way, that's but looking, that's looking okay. fantastic. I think the thing is, if you're stressing too much about the cakes, I think that's the problem. You just got to relax and enjoy it. And I think if you enjoy it, your cakes are going to be better. It's funny people say that, but it's true. By the 1930s. Britain's consumption of sugar and butter was up almost 50% on the Edwardian era. Yet home baking was in decline. It was high street bakers like the Devlins who now filled our cake holes. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, gosh, look. And oh. how easy is that? It's easy, actually, and you're right. It's about confidence. And I do, I do yeah. feel so much more confident. There uh, we go, you see. <laughs> and it does yeah. feel good, and, and I do feel more relaxed. Great. Just amazing. Absolutely amazing. Caroline returns home not just with new skills, but something the bakery can sell until the bread oven is fixed. Look what I made. Oh, very good. Are you... Ooh, oh, look. Quite oh, right. They look kind of nice. From scratch. Did you? It's it's yeah. 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 It was amazing. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. quite nice. Yeah, but I'd never, I never thought I could make that. No, did I, John? I know. <laughs> I know. Well done. <laughs> At the dressmakers, Jill has been commissioned to make a dress from scratch. I'm making Harriet a summer dress out of this um, pink cotton with the little turquoise flowers on it. It's very nice to be making my first dress of the era. It's like coming home, doing something bespoke. Oh, it's so enjoyable, isn't it? You just sit here and somebody takes your measurements and it fits you. And you know it's unique. Nobody else is going to have that dress. But bespoke clothing isn't where the biggest profits lie. Jill should be maximising her takings by selling off-the-peg stock. Any takers? Oh, I don't know. I'll have to have a little think. OK. <laughs> but if there's anything you want me to put to one side, I'd be very happy to do it for you. Have a little think, it'll still be here tomorrow. Don't like doing the hard sell thing. I think if people want stuff, especially one-off stuff, then they'll have it and they don't need to be talked into it because it speaks for itself, it sells itself. Jill has rapidly reverted to what she knows best. I'm taking commissions this week as well for bespoke dresses, so if there's nothing on the rack that you no. particularly like, then I could make you something. I would quite like one. I do go to a lot of young farmers' balls and it'd be nice to have something that no one else would have. If it's fitted here, just here, that's OK, and then flowing after that, if you know what cool. I mean. Cool. Yeah, I think that would be perfect. The luxury of having something made just for me, that's something that I've never got to do before, so I can't wait, and I know I'll treasure it and keep it forever and all that, so I can't wait. At the Baker's, there's finally a product for sale. I think it's going very well, actually. The people are really pleased to see the variety of cakes, and I don't think one person's left without a cake, which is... It's a money spinner there. Oh, that is glorious. That really is nice. You can really taste the, the spice in that. And there's more good news. The oven is now working. We we'll still need to play around a little bit with the temperatures because we don't have a thermometer. But yes, it's it's yes, it's an awful lot easier. An awful lot easier. So they can get on with baking bread. 
once we get the bread and people get to know that the bread is back, we're on course to make more money this week. Although the 1930s High Street was still dominated by independent traders, the big brand saw it as a place to advertise. The Chamber of Commerce have sent packaging historian Robert Opie to teach the shopkeepers the art of the hard sell. What, what, what goodies have you got? Well, lots of wonderful things. Promotional uh, material. They look point, uh, point of sale they're just material. So big. Things to get your public excited, your customers uh, yeah. engaged with the things that you've now started to sell. You're Carl selling... spots another chance to take money from the pockets of junior customers. Oh, yes. Yes. If you put this in your window, yep. all the children will come in to get their free Sunny Jim masks, and hopefully you'll sell a packet every time. Well, obviously this was definitely um, aimed at the children, so that, 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 as it, you know, as they come along the street with mummy and daddy, they see this in the window and go, I want one, I want one, I want one. Even one, 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 one. in the 30s, there was pester power. As Robert Opie delivers posters to all the shops, the high street is about to embrace the art of advertising like never before. The butchers start a leafleting campaign. How about Angus beef? It's been no home for speaking. three weeks. No speaking English. Ah. I'm from Bulgaria. OK, thank you. But the grocers are thinking bigger. Do you know what? I think over there it'll just fit it, you know? It's probably oh, yeah. the perfect size. Should we On go the and butchers have wall? Yeah. Yeah, right, right. I'll let I'm sure place. Andrew will be happy with that. Debbie's so sure she doesn't actually ask the butchers first. Mmm, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> I feel a rental issue coming on here. It definitely stands out. I think we're going to run out of sardines tomorrow, Harry. <laughs> well done. <laughs> the only thing that's going to stop me taking that down is if they let me put a flyer in every corner of their window and on their door. Hello, Mrs. Sergison. So what we'll do, right, we'll have four of these in your window. OK. And if they're in a ridiculous place, I'll come back and change it. Yeah? OK. Thank you. Have a good day. But Debbie doesn't keep her side of the bargain. Only one flyer appears in the window. It's going to go Eight. mental, isn't it? Eight. <laughs> I'm not best pleased about that, since I am um, from the beginning. We've always had rivalry with the grocers. They got it easy. They don't have to prepare anything. They walk into the shop every year and ta-da, everything's on a shelf, priceless. There you go. I'll have a bag of flour. There you go. It's a five. It's easy life being a grocer. It's like shelling peas, isn't it? Like shelling peas, aye. Government legislation now limited how late shops could open and how long staff could work. So the shops are shutting at five. For the Surgisons, it's a chance to put their feet up. I don't really want to say it, but I thought it was an easy day. I'm going to send you a nine to five, which is a dot, instead of like a sort of like seven or eight in the morning till like seven, eight at night. But even when their shop is closed, the bakers can't stop working. Nine to five, more fun, plenty of recreation. Uh -uh, not for the devil in me. Unlike other shops on the high street, they can't take advantage of mass-produced goods. They still make all their stock themselves. What have you got in there now? We've got the rest of the bread, which should be about ready now. I don't need those. And the arrival of electricity hasn't saved as much labour as they'd hoped. It's just really, really long, thankless hours for very little return. <laughs> and if I'm really being honest, I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. After a long day trying to be a salesman, Simon's at the back of his shop doing the work he really loves. He's moulding some toy soldiers. When I'm here in my forge, I'm like a kid in a toy shop. In the 1870s High Street, Simon's skills were at the heart of his business and the community. But history is leaving blacksmiths like him behind. The forge is, is not really working to its full capacity. In the Victorian era, it was very much in demand for, for making everyday items. In this era, the 1930s era, there's a lot of mass-produced things, uh, and the forge is not necessarily needed on a daily basis anymore. In an attempt to prove that his craft still has a place, 
he knocks up one of the most traditional of toys. It can still entertain, but even in the 1930s, when toys from Lego to Monopoly were already being mass-produced, iron hoops were not the way to make a fortune. But then that's not really Simon's ambition. I'm not too worried about making an absolute fortune. As long as I make enough money to keep going and keep my shop stocked and keep everybody happy, then that, that's fine for me. I'll never be a millionaire at what I do. Others on the high street are more focused on putting money in the till and putting one over on each other. I think we took more money than the surgeons today. And that's always a plus. We always want to beat them. I was chatting to the butchers earlier and they reckon they sent me 300 quid today. We could still take the most amount of money, but it's going to be really close. Oh, come on, Simon, don't break it. By the middle of the week, the 30s High Street is in full swing. Come on, Savvy, breakfast. Come on, Such an early start, no makeup yet. The butchers, with their new cuts of beef, is proving particularly popular. Michael's determined to prove his skills as a salesman. Well, this is a top side. Oh, right. Yeah. It's a gorgeous roast. So roast it normal way? Not too much. So don't overdo it, because it'll be horrible. Though sometimes wisdom does come with age. No, that's silver side. And whereas normally they'd say, like, 20 minutes a pound, this probably needs quite a bit longer. Because silver side's got a lovely flavour, but it is very dry if you don't do it properly. Oh, How right. Can you be? And very tough <laughs> if you don't cook it long enough. At the Devlin store, one of their key ranges is definitely outselling the other. It's interesting. We're selling very little bread at the moment. I haven't had to bake during the day. It's unusual. I think the emphasis is now on cake production. Jack, you need to be out here. Sort out this bit here. This is your area. Sort it out. The 30s saw less work and more play for most kids. But interwar laws preventing children working didn't extend to family businesses. So, just as in previous eras, even eight-year-old Chloe is mucking in. Chloe, come and do this with Dad. Given the fact that all the girls and the boys um, are contributing to this, it's working really well. Can you get two bowls? Get two bowls. Wash your hands. Get two bowls. I'm just ignoring you, Rafe, when you're like this. The Chamber of Commerce are visiting town to see how the shopkeepers are getting on. Fifth-generation baker Tom Herbert starts with the shop he knows best. In, in some ways, we were lulled into a, if you like, a bit of a false sense of security because it seemed to be that things were slightly more relaxed and less full-on. We're, we're still working 17-hour days. Yeah. Um, plus, with the, with the added um, uh, issue of uh, lack of staff and serving yeah. in the tea rooms, mm. so the children are actually working harder now can I say, than they've ever done. How do you feel about that? Uh, we feel extremely disappointed that life for other children was better, but life for our own children was significantly worse. My grandfather, you know, during this era, all you hear about is them working in the bakery and um, the highlights are kind of doing deliveries on the horse and car, that kind of thing, you know, it's all work. I guess you're just living proof of that. At the toy shop, Simon admits his salesmanship still needs work. When the kids are in here looking at the stuff, I, I do get involved myself and, and I do find myself wasting quite a bit of time. So possibly I'm not such a hard-nosed businessman as I should be. I've, right. actually, I've actually given a few toys away as well, which I probably shouldn't do. <laughs> yeah. but... uh, well, we'll bear that in mind when we look at your books, that some things were given away. <laughs> Let's face it, he's not really being a salesman. I see Simon standing there, you know, with his, uh, his thumbs in his overalls, smiling benignly at people. Fine, but that's not being a shopkeeper, and that's what he's got to do. The Chamber of Commerce also has a major change in trading laws to announce. In the 1930s, the law decreed that you must take a day off every week. So tomorrow, Sunday, there is no work for any of you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just look at the children. <laughs> You're going to have a day off tomorrow. Yes, going to have a day off. Not everyone is happy about this government interference. 
I don't want a day off. I just want to sell all of this beast, maybe order some more and sell that. Meanwhile, in the advertising war, Debbie the grocer's wife is resorting to underhand tactics. We've got the butcher's flyer here, and the beef is absolutely amazing. Oh, yeah. But if you take that flyer over there, you're yeah. sure to get a discount as well. Okay, thank you. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Let them know I sent you over. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yep. We've just been come out from the grocery shop mm -hmm. and she said, if I produce this leaflet, you're going to give me a nice discount on, on some steak. Did she really say she that? She did really yes, say yeah. that. She yes, did. She did. We'd get a discount. Um. <laughs> As the competition mounts, the Sharps are more determined than ever to get ahead of the grocers. One way to maximise their profits is to sell every last bit of their cow. So, we have a bit of a cunning plan for Michael's commerciality. We're, um, we're going to beat the surgeons at their own game because we're going to utilise something that's pretty negative, kidney fat, and we're going to make it into a lovely set of puddings. Grating the hard fat from around the cow's kidneys produces suet. Mixed with flour and steamed, it forms the basis of traditional stodgy puddings that kids have loved for generations. Everybody wins. They get something lovely to eat. We get something lovely to sell. And the poor grocers won't know what's eat them. This is going to be our time to shine. That evening, looking forward to their first day off, there's high spirits on the high street. Michael's getting his own back on Debbie. Carl, look what he's doing. Michael, you're such a tossed pot. I honestly don't know where he gets it from. <laughs> <laughs> and with no trading in the morning, the men drink late into the night. Oh, very good. Snookers. Oh, you little rascal. It's the morning after, and there are a few sore heads on the high street. I think I'm going to be in a bit of trouble, actually. I, I did my video diary, most of it in the pub last night. <laughs> it wasn't me, it was my twin brother. It's amazing how alike we are. I'm the quiet one, and he's just a little bit less quiet. Carl takes advantage of the calm and sneaks out to change the poster. But look, the uh, sign's done. It's perfect. Very good. Who did that? 50% <laughs> of all orders. <laughs> There's news about their day off from the Chamber of Commerce. What's this? What's this? A greetings telegram. I have a telegram, chaps. <clears throat> You'll be travelling to the seaside in 1930s style. Off the seaside? Oh. Well, good. <laughs> seaside. Sing song. Bottle of beer, you know. <laughs> but before they can enjoy their leisure time, there's another trip they can't get out of. Church attendance in the 1930s was double what it is today. Well, actually, it's a bit of a chance for a sit down and, yeah, a bit of time off. The blessing of All God our shopkeepers are present and correct, with one exception. The law banning Sunday trading allowed shops to open if they sold daily necessities, such as milk, fruit and veg, something Carl wants to take advantage of. It's really cool, and I think it's really kind of groovy is the butchers can't open, and I can, so I've got an extra few hours trading before I go to the beach. So whilst they're praying and singing to God, I shall be taking God's good money. Thank you very much. <laughs> Knowing that the butchers have sold so much beef in this era, Carl sees an opportunity to cash in. And what about some of my lovely horseradish? I, I only want one of those. Um, yep, yeah, well, I think one's enough. Yeah, yeah, one's enough. Can I tempt you to buy one? <laughs> Thank you, sweetheart. That's <laughs> fabulous. Thank you very much. You take care. Sold a lot. Butcher's closed. I'm happy. I've taken my dosh. He's at church. Happy days. With the church service over and most shops closed, there's still no rest for those making goods by hand. 
I'm very busy today. I need to go back to my workshop and um, finish a couple of dresses, so I'm not going to be joining everybody else at the seaside, I'm afraid. We're under real pressure to produce for tomorrow, and consequently my good wife uh, won't be joining us either. I don't get to go to the seaside. I can't go out and play today. <laughs> At least for the kids, for the first time this week, life is going to be a picnic. What, what are you looking forward to at the seaside? Splashing. Splashing. It wasn't just on Sundays that workers were taking time out. By the late 1930s, some 11 million Britons were entitled to paid holiday, wow. albeit only for a week. Like our shopkeepers, often whole workplaces would down tools the same week and head off together. You can imagine people who've never bloody been anywhere in their lives, not out of their own town or village, getting on this, and it'd be like flying to the moon, wouldn't it? What better place could you wish to be in, eh? On a sunny day, with all your mates, going to the beach. The shopkeepers are heading to the traditional seaside town of Clevedon. Cheers, old boy. That's nice. Some of the traders are understandably shell-shocked to be beside the sea. After all, they haven't had a day off since the 1870s. It seems really strange to be doing nothing. <laughs> I, I really feel as if I ought to be doing something, to be honest. It's going to take quite a, getting, quite a bit of getting used to to actually have some, some leisure time. Oh, come on, girls, in the front. As more of Britain took a holiday, more people wanted to take holiday snaps. Right, a bit tighter in together. An early form of plastic, Bakelite, was used to make cameras cheap enough for ordinary people to afford. Cheese! Yeah, it's a go, yeah! <laughs> but not everyone is in the picture. I had quite a productive day. Long, but productive. And not over yet. Jill is still at work on the same three dresses she's been making all week. It is labour intensive, really labour intensive. That's why I work such long hours, because you take the commissions when you can get them, and then they've just got to be finished. I've got something here for you. Oh, wow, have you got swimwear? Yay! Swimwear. <laughs> oh, my God, this is horrible. Oh, Here's mine. This is something impossible. How are you going to put them on? <laughs> you will never ever let that down, Jack. Keep on straight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's itchy and it's tight and it's so scummy. <laughs> But while the boys might feel overly covered up, Debbie is feeling quite the opposite. I've literally gone from being a Victorian grocer's wife, where I've been literally clothed from to the neck right down to the floor, and now, just today, actually having a lovely bikini on. I do feel very liberated, and I'm sure when these women would have put these on, they would have felt the same. <laughs> Go on, Rev, go for it! Can you imagine actually being in the 30s and actually having a day? It would have been, it would have been such a planned event and it would have been amazing and getting on the carriage trip. You can't literally work and work and work all the time. You have to have family time, you have to have leisure time. Otherwise, why are you working if you haven't got time to spend your money and have fun with the family? We've come to the conclusion that we are facilitating the, the more well-off lower classes and the middle classes um, leisure time. We're actually working our socks off so that they can come in and sit and eat nice cake and drink cups of tea and just take life easier. Um, 
And we're not getting any of that. As Caroline and Jill have discovered, more leisure time just wasn't an option for traders who had to make what they sold. The recipe for an easy life is to deal in mass-produced goods. So it's been a grand day out for those who could afford to take it. Tomorrow is the final day of 1930s trading, and despite a welcome break, the shopkeepers can't keep their minds off business rivalries for long. I know we won't take as much money as Michael thinks we will from a few puddings, but it'll give us a giggle and it'll give the surgeons a bit of a, a stick in the ribs, so <laughs> that'll be quite funny. The last day of trading will be a special occasion. Shepton Mallet is going to experience a national event that Britain has long since forgotten. Empire Day was held annually on Queen Victoria's birthday. The hope is that the Empire Day celebrations will draw crowds into the high street, giving all the shopkeepers a last chance to make some serious money. So the plan today is that we're going to get the 50% off of the Empire Day special, I want the raffles ready, and I want the hamper ready, and the sweet jar ready for 9 o'clock, so it's all no from, from the start. And the race between the butchers and grocers to make the most money has reached fever pitch. And it's an Aberdeen Angus, so it's absolutely beautiful. This is absolutely everything we have left. We have rump here, and it'll be the best day you've ever had in your life. There's no more than this. I think this 50% off is really working. I don't go in because it's absolutely bunged. In, in 10 minutes, I think I've just made it at least 80 quid. No more than about 100 quid in, in like 10 minutes. You think his life depended on getting all that beef sold? I am not the boy anymore. I am the man. <laughs> <laughs> it was the butcher's boy that was so good at selling it. He, um, he absolutely convinced me that it's what I needed and it's what I wanted and how good it would taste. Last bit of beef, ten pounds worth of brazen steak for a fiver. Come on, there you Thank go. You. Thank you very much. Too slow. At Jill's dress shop, there's rather less bustle. During the week, she's concentrated on making rather than selling. Her off-the-peg stock remains unsold. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah. And that's meant she's been working 15-hour days. But at least she's finally finished the bespoke dresses customers ordered. OK, you're all ready. You look amazing. Hey! Oh, wow. Ta-da! Brilliant. <laughs> oh, good. I'm so pleased. <laughs> <laughs> you look wonderful. And your shoes are perfect with it as well. Yeah. Very perfect. <laughs> oh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Children celebrated Empire Day by dressing up as figures from British myth and history. With so many young customers in town, it's no surprise that Simon's Toy Shop is packed. This is really to commemorate Empire Day. I've made these in the forge, yeah. and they're little skittle soldiers. So oh. I've, I've cast these. Oh, they are beautiful. I'll keep them for my whole life. You've got to share it with your brother as well, though. Yeah. Do you think you can swap it for his DS? <laughs> hey, no way! <laughs> and for the first time all week, Simon's giving it the hard sell, too. To attract custom to his store, he's arranged for a giant outdoor display of some of the 1930s most popular toys. I think this is a fantastic example of, of British ingenuity. Fantastic, anyway, for, especially for kids. <laughs> the bakers are also targeting the young consumer. Yeah. We're going to yeah. overdose all the little darlings on jammy, icy, glacé, cherry ridden kind of. It's just going to be sugar heaven, isn't it? Wow. And even the butcher has something for the kids. Really for the good children of Shepton Mallet, the big ones and the little ones. Though the suet puddings were planned as a grocer beating money spinner, the butcher's hearts are melted by the children's festival and they end up giving their product away. Right, who's for suet pudding, Cumberland pudding, jam roly poly? Put your hand up. It tastes a bit like Christmas pudding in a way, but it is really, really, really nice. It didn't taste like there was any meat in the one that we just had. What is suet? 
It's just fat, basically. What fat? Well, it's it's fat that's around the kidney, so it's really hard. But it doesn't, it's not always from the kidney, so you can chill so out. So there's meat in my pudding. Just <laughs> yeah, there is. That's the idea. You we knew have. we'd get away with that, didn't we? We're yeah. not confectioners. We are butchers. There's got oh, to be yeah. some meat in there. Yeah. Forgot. Did you did you like it? I love it. Exactly. With the party in full swing, the Chamber of Commerce have come to judge the performance of the 1930s High Street. Ta da St George! Is your, is your mummy a dragon? Follow me! The people of Shepton are clearly enjoying Empire Day lovely community spirit which is was there in the 30s it really was just like stepping back into the past i think that getting all the kids together on an event like empire day is brilliant um, it would be great to do more of that nowadays if they start as kids it will grow and develop and you get a, a much nicer tighter communities the people have bought into the 1930s experience but have they bought into the products it's time for the chamber of commerce to look at the shopkeepers trading figures Jills are the first to be scrutinised. The takings are £325. It's not that great. She had off-the-peg fashions to sell, which were affordable, and she hardly sold any. No, I think you're being a bit hard on her. She's proved what the, the demand for a dressmaker is. It's not to sort of sell what everybody else is selling. It is to sell those special things for special days. I gave myself a little mission to bring glamour to Shepton Mallet, and I think I can safely say mission accomplished. <laughs> the High Street's other artisan faced a similar challenge. We asked Simon to take the transition from maker of product to seller of product. I've got to say, we're never ever convinced about his salesmanship, but there is no arguing with that man's trading figures. My grand total is £790.25p, which I think is absolutely amazing. It's more or less double my total for the Edwardian era. Simon's triumph is partly down to his Empire Day display. And unlike Jill, he didn't have to spend hours making what he sold. I have to say, I think the products almost sold themselves. They were so attractive. <laughs> Basically, he stood there with his hands in his pockets, smiling benignly. The bakers have produced the centrepiece for the Empire Day celebrations. Thank yeah, you very much. You Thank you. It's absolutely delicious. It's nice. the time to taste, I feel. But have they also made a decent profit? The bakers have most certainly got the toughest job. And I just don't want them to get down because people do love the shop and they are producing some very good stuff. Um, they're just not taking the money the others are doing. They just can't produce and sell in enough quantity. They've clearly not got the sales. They did just a smidge over £300 for all of that effort. Excellent cake, Mrs Devlin. Very nice. The bakers remind us that the 30s were a tough time. You know, it wasn't easy for everybody. Uh, I've actually found it even more heartbreaking in terms of what kind of life they bakers had and their families. It was still very hard work, relatively little profit, and that was really a 30s experience. Is it worth it, you know? And yet you're locked into it because this is what your business is and you can't walk away because to what? You, you have to stay here and you have to stick it out and this is your life. But this decade, there have only been two real contenders for the most popular shop on the high street. Those butchers, you know, are doing an outstanding job. Mm. Their takings are going up and up every week. Yeah. But only do you get quality meat from them and people are flocking to it, you actually get real information. The mystery has got to be, with that butcher shop as popular as it's becoming, why there aren't butcher shops in every high street. How's the sweets, kids? Are they good? Yeah. Come on, I can't hear you. Yeah. yeah, that's better. Yeah. Thank you very much, very kind. Yeah. Now I'm going to reply. <laughs> The grocers are just having an armchair ride because they've now got produce on their shelves that people recognise. They've got kids here, we've got a shop stacked full of sweets as well. And of course, because a lot of the stuff's pre-packaged, it's so much quicker. In the end, there's no arguing with the final accounts. 
The butchers takings this week are virtually double what they were the week before. Yeah. Incredible. He's taken 600 quid. But, as in the Victorian and Edwardian era, it's the ancestors of today's supermarkets who have come out on top. <laughs> They've made a killing this week again. They're way out in front of everyone else with £1,300 <laughs> plus but this worth is of sale. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you've now completed your third week and really we wanted to see if you could make the people of this town fall in love with the 1930s shopping experience. I think you have given shopping and the high street a whole new lease of life to a brand new generation of shoppers. There's a whole new generation of whose image now of the high street is of something quite exciting, a place of fun. Wonderful, wonderful achievement. Next week, the high street is World War II. And shopkeepers were right at the forefront of the British war effort. And relationships between shopkeepers and customers got very strained. I would prepare yourselves, if I were you, for a fair bit of flack. Good luck. Bit of bulldog spirit, you're gonna need it. Next time, it's war on the high street. I've got no fruit, no vegetables. I've just, there's nothing to sell. Can you tell me if there's anything I can buy without a ration book? There is rabbits. Anything else? Rabbit? <laughs> Problem is that I've used up all my rations. Everyone is feeling the strain. I'm on top of the big hell. I mean, God, no, can you just go? Can you just go for now, OK? Can you, please? But all I wanted was bloody baps. How hard is it? They've made the bread. And Carl finds out that making a profit in wartime is criminal. It's got to be a fiver. Fiver? It's got to be, isn't it? It's serious, this, and I'm going to have to make you realise how serious it was. 